You know, it's, it's like I just told y'all that uh, we're in spiritual warfare in this world. And, and that's what we talked about uh, out of the book of Daniel in Sunday school this morning. Uh, sometimes it doesn't seem like it. You know, when you're going about your day-to-day life, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't think about that. But uh, I also need to keep in mind what Peter said about the devil. That he goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And you may not look at it, you know, this, this little country church stuck out here to, with hardly anything around it much. You know, what's to be bothered right here? But I can assure you that uh, Satan's emissaries or ambassadors or whatever you want to call them want to see this church destroyed because that's what he's all about, stealing, killing, and destroying. And uh, he doesn't like the church. He doesn't like the church in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't like you. He don't like Christians. He might not can take your salvation, but he'll do everything he can to make sure that your witness isn't any good. Doesn't bring anybody to Christ. But uh, we're going to be looking at a couple of scriptures here. Uh, the first one, I want to read the first verse of uh, chapter 32 of Second Chronicles. And uh, I guess, you know, I, I named this, uh, The Enemy Hates Revival. Which he does. The enemy hates revival in a church because that means he's going to lose out. But uh, what shall our reaction be? But you could just easily name it spiritual warfare because this is what was going on even back then. So Second Chronicles uh, chapter 32 verse 1. It says, After these things and these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. I want you to just ponder on that just a second. It talks about all the revival that had taken place under the reign of Hezekiah in Judah. You remember all the different things he had done. He had been faithful to God, the people... They came around. They started being faithful to God. They started trusting the Lord. And so everything's great. They got a great revival going on. People are back the way they should be. So it's all good from here on out, right? But he says, after these acts of faithfulness, look what happens. The king of Assyria comes and invades Judah and sets himself against the kingdom of Judah, the Lord's people. You could uh, equate the same thing as the act of the devil because he was under the influence of Satan. Uh, The Assyrians, if you ever read anything about them, they were probably the most cruel people in history. They would would take people and and, uh, flay them alive. And, you know, and I'm talking about uh, skinning them alive. They were that cruel and that horrible, the Assyrians were. And Sennacherib was the king. And they were very proud of all their conquests because they were able to, you know, conquer mostly all of the Middle East at this time. All the way down to Egypt, they had their way. And this is the way they lived, in cruelty and under the influence of Satan. But here all these people were, they were being faithful. They came to God and were showing all these acts of faithfulness. And this comes against them. So we need to keep this in mind no matter what we've got going on. You know, if we manage to see a great revival and people coming to God and people coming into church, people being more faithful to the church, you think that's a reason why everything's just going to go smooth from now on on? till the end of our lives on this earth or till Jesus comes back? No. That's not how it works. Satan is going to come against us. And he's done it before. I mean, y'all, y'all know he's done it before right here. 
Any kind of, any kind of uh, upset or upheaval you have going on in a church, I can promise you that's where it comes from. Amen. It comes from Satan. Yeah, he may be using people. He may be using his influence over people where they're too proud or they're, you know, too self-centered or whatever it is, but he's going to take that and tweak it so he can downgrade a church. Like a saying I heard one time, downgrade usually comes, starts off slowly, but then all of a sudden it comes quick. And you start seeing all kinds of problems. But we're going to look at what King Hezekiah did. If you'll, if you'll now turn to 2 Kings chapter 19. Hezekiah has been warned. I can, I can tell you about all this other stuff that they did, but I'm not going to read all that. But they started trying to do things to keep the King Sennacherib and the Assyrians from coming into their city. The first thing they did, they started building up the walls, you know, to make them harder for the Assyrians to get into. They started stopping up all the springs so they wouldn't be able to get the water. But I, I can tell you, none of that was going to stop them. None of that was going to stop them. They were going to be able to get in without the Lord's intervention. And it says in chapter 19 of Second Kings... Verse 1, as soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. That's what people did back then when they, when they were just astounded by something in great grief or mourning or, or didn't know what to do. They'd tear their clothes. Don't do that today. But, uh, and... Uh, you know, probably don't need to cover yourself in sackcloth, but that's totally up to you. But uh, this was serious business with them. They would also, they throw ashes on their head. This was a great sign of mourning back in those days. And for the king to do it, that was really serious. He knew the seriousness of this problem. Yeah, they were in the middle of a great revival. But guess what? Satan didn't like it. He did not like it. So it says, King Hezekiah, in verse 2, it says, He sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was here during this time. The son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth and there is no strength to be them forth, bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of the Rabshakeh, who was the official in charge, left in charge by a Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. There lift, therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So this is what's going on right now. He said, you know, they had so little strength, it was like a, a woman who run out of strength and couldn't bring forth a child in childbirth. That's how bad it was. They were just, they were just at a point where they couldn't do nothing else. Well, I guess you could say Hezekiah saw the writing on the wall that he was not going to be able to prevail unless there was a divine intervention from God into the life of Judah. Assyria had already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. All there was was Judah left in Jerusalem. And now the king of Assyria decided he was going to take it. The rough, rough times. And you know what? Our rough times, personally, church-wide, sometimes even nationwide, they come on us out of nowhere. We're totally not expecting them. Right. Not prepared, as we talked about this morning. We're not prepared for what happens. Just like Israel, caught by surprise over there. 
They were just living their lives, you know, as best they could. They had trouble all along, but they never had anything like this. You know, it said that this is their 9-11. Hundreds and hundreds of them who live outside, uh, close to the Gaza Strip, have been killed. And plenty of them hauled off. And it's, it's, it's ugly. It's terrible. People are asking, well, why weren't you prepared? You know, they say there's an intelligence failure or whatever. And, and they, there had to have been for them to come in so sneaky like that and man, it managed to get in like they did. But the point I'm trying to get across here is Satan catches us unaware sometimes. We live our lives unprepared sometimes. Not ready for what's to come. And sometimes, you know, be fair. You know, how could we see it coming? You know, you don't see cancer coming till it hits you. You don't see a lot of things. But there's a lot of things we can do to be prepared for whatever hits us. And we're going to see what happened right here. So this is what Isaiah said. Say to your master, to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. So, the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah and told him, said, don't worry about this. I'm going to handle it. And there's a lot of things that we worry about that if we just leave it in God's hands, we could trust that he was going to take care of it. Amen. You know, uh, it's just like our church. I don't worry about it. I don't worry about the future of the church because it's in God's hands. Amen. All I want is for all of us to be on one page and in the same accord and prepared for growth. Growth like God wants to see growth. Spiritual maturity out of our members and growth as God gives, you know, as, as God grants it. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see us like so many churches, you know, where they wind up having to close the doors. Where, believe it or not, it happens all over the country, a lot more than you might think. I want us to be that lampstand. I know y'all probably tired of hearing that word, but I want us to be that lampstand that God intended for us to be right here in this community. That's what I want to work on. But we need to be aware that the devil ain't going to like it and be prepared for battles, spiritual battles. Just as we talked about this morning in Sunday school, there are going to be spiritual battles. And it comes uh, because Satan is totally against us. He's against us. He's going to use it easy if he can, you know, because we're so easily swayed to and fro. If he can do that, he'll do it. But he can come up with even more stuff. He can figure it out. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Y'all have seen it before. Satan to figure out a way to destroy. So anyhow, this uh, call him the Reb Shaka, but he was like you know the man that he was uh, the one that was the diplomatic man, I guess you might call it, for the king of Assyria. He sent messages to Hezekiah saying, "Thus you shall speak to the king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you." by promising that Jerusalem will be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Will not be given into the king of the hand of Assyria. So he's insulting God now here. He says, Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And how shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed? And he goes on listing these different nations. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hena, or the king of Iva? So he's saying all this stuff in a letter 
telling them, say, where are all these guys at? Their gods didn't save them. What makes yours so special? Well, he didn't understand the God that we worship. He didn't understand at all. But let me tell you and let me show you what Hezekiah did next. So Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. So he saw what this emissary of Satan was telling him. And he read it. Did he go weeping and wailing and crying and said, we've got to figure out a way to get out of here. We can't do it. We, we, we got to go slip out, sneak away. No, that ain't what he did. It says, and Hezekiah, after he read it, he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. He spread that later letter out before the Lord in the temple. Have y'all ever got before the Lord and, and had something that was written down that was really causing you something, some distress and just laid it before God? I've done that. I've done it. Now, I ain't ashamed to admit it. I laid it before the Lord. And that's what he did right here. And he worshiped God. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherim, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So he sent up this prayer to God and, and something in our Sunday school class made me remember that. You remember when Daniel was praying before the Lord and the angel appeared before him and said, the time you started praying, God was sending an answer. God was sending an answer. When you have something burdening your life, and you trust the Lord and you love the Lord and you worship Him and you come before Him and lay it before Him, He's already sending the answer. He's going to make it known to you. And even if it's delayed, and it can be delayed by days, weeks, months, maybe years. If you're praying for somebody to be saved, you know, you may not even live to see it. You may have prayers answered that you don't live to see, but are you going to trust God that He's going to answer these prayers for you? Are you going to believe in Him? Amen. Are you going to believe like Hezekiah did? Have you ever got down on your knees before the Lord and spread out your prayers before Him and said, Lord, look at this. This is what I got. I need you to help me with this. And give God the glory for it. Let me just tell you, he's waiting. He's waiting to hear from you. Just like Daniel. He's waiting to send you an answer. He's going to work it out in his time and his way. But he's waiting to hear from you. And that's, that's what I'm doing right now. This is the thing I want about revival. I'm waiting for God to answer us. I'm waiting for God to work it out in our lives. I'm waiting God to make it happen right here with me and in this church. And I'm trusting He's going to do that. Amen. I'm trusting Him and I'm believing that that's exactly what's... So anyhow, we're not going to go into all this, uh, uh, what God says about uh, through Isaiah. <clears throat> But if you look down there at verse 29, he says, And this shall be a sign to you. This year eat what grows of itself. 
In other words, get what you can and survive. Survive. And in the second year, what springs of the same? Continue to survive during your struggles, during your times. You know, we say, well, I wish God would would uh, pour out his hand on me and bring me all this plenty. Sometimes you just got to hang in there and keep trusting God and survive through your tough times and just keep your faith in God through all of it. And then in verse 30 he says, And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. I missed something there. It says, Then in the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. So after survival, things start getting better for them. Trusting in God that he's going to make it right for them. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. Taking root downward. Let that root that you have of your faith go downward into that soil where it can grow. That soil is the word of God. And your obedience to God. And then it's going to bear fruit upward. God's going to see it. You're going to bear fruit. It'll be beyond survival. You'll be trusting in God. No, this is not a prosperity gospel. This is just telling what the Lord is going to do for you if you trust in Him. Doesn't mean He's going to make you rich. You know, you're not going to have uh, jet airplanes like them TV preachers talk folks into paying for. Or big mansions. If you get all that, that's great. I'm proud for you. But God is going to help you to do more than just survive. Amen. He's going to put you in a place of favor. And that favor is going to be spiritual by trusting in Him. And you're always going to have what you need. It's always going to be there. He goes on to say, For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. Satan's not going to overcome us. We're going to survive the attacks of the devil if we trust in God and put our faith in Him. Laying it before Him. Laying your letter of complaint before Him and saying, Lord, this is what I got. And I need you to help me in this time right now. Have you ever been that desperate to do something like that? I can tell you I have. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I've been so desperate I laid it out there before the Lord. And he answered my prayers. Praise God for that. And let me show you what happened. This is really a long story. You'll have to go back in there and read it all for yourself about how this all turned out. But uh, this is what the Lord said. He shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield to cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same he shall return. And he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it. For my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. That's what the Lord told them. And they believed what God was going to say. They didn't know how he was going to do it. They knew they couldn't do it. They They didn't have the armies to do this. They knew if they laid siege to that city, they were going to starve to death. But they trusted God. And this is what happened. Verse 35. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead bodies. These were all dead bodies. Can you imagine that? When God says he's going to deliver us, we're going to be delivered. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it looks like. We're going to be delivered because he said so. Because he said so. And when people arose, they, they 
found nothing but dead bodies. Verse 36, Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, struck him down with a sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, Esar his son, reigned in his place. So this king Sennacherib who was going to destroy Judah, look what wound up with him. His army was destroyed before the walls of Jerusalem by the angel of the Lord coming through at night and killing every one of them. But not him. He ran home only to be killed in front of his, uh, the altar of his idol by his own sons. He was slain. So God delivered Hezekiah. He delivered Judah. And it all began when Hezekiah laid the letters written by Sennacherib before the Lord. So if you've got something that's just tearing you up right now and you can't get over it or get through it, I'm telling you, if you trust in God and you believe in the Lord and you trust Jesus and His Word, you lay that before the Lord. Give it to Him. Give it to Him. And ask the Lord to bring it forth. And I promise you, the answer will be sent to you. It's on the way. It's on the way. And I pray the same thing for our church right here. I know God hears us. All these times we've prayed for revival and are continuing to pray for revival, those times me and Bobby and Tommy were up here praying those mornings, I know God heard us. Amen. He heard us. And every, every member of this church was prayed for. Amen. Every single one by name was prayed for. And we're just praying that God's going to do a work right here yes. in our church, in our community, yes. and continue on. And also, I'm praying that our needs are met. If you've got something that's really on your heart and you want to lay it before the Lord uh, in private, that's fine. You do so. But just do it. Lay it before the Lord. Or you can come down here right now and lay it before the Lord if you want. And if you don't know Christ, this is a great morning to figure out what do I have to do. And I'll be glad to pray with you and, and help you any way I can. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you and we can talk about what it means to come to Jesus Christ. If you want to talk about joining this church, we can talk about that and uh, it's all good. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That's what the Lord wants to do for us because He loves us. He loves us. God doesn't want to see anyone perish, but that all should come to repentance. So as we do the, uh, as we do our invitation, if you'd like to come down here and pray or whatever you'd like to do, talk to me. That's all good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick. Father, I come before you right now, Lord, and I pray. Lord, if someone has a decision they need to make today, I pray, Father, that you will help them make the right one. Lord, I pray you'll touch their hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll lead us in the direction you want this church to go. We just trust you, Lord. We put our faith in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.